Welcome to A Taste of Torah, where you discover the sweetness of the scroll each week with your host, Rhonda Wagner, as she shares faith and encouragement from a Christian perspective found in weekly Torah readings. Come listen and let your heart be lifted with a little taste of Torah. Grace and peace, beloved of God. Welcome to A Little Taste of Torah. It's time for us to talk to her one more time, and I'm so thankful to be here with you. I pray that your holidays were full of his grace and and his joy and his peace as we are coming through the season of Christmas and Hanukkah and really preparing for um, the new year on our Western calendar But we know on a Hebrew calendar, we've already been in the Hebrew year of 5783. And so this week, we are going to um, discuss this next Torah portion, which is Vayigash. And we've been discussing the life of Joseph. And so we're coming in on the revealing of the dreamer where Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And so I'm really excited to speak with you about this particular Torah portion as we shared in the past or the last Torah portion. Uh, the life of Joseph is a very significant archetype of the life of Christ. And we shared a little bit in the last Torah portion how in the traditional Jewish faith, there are um, many messiahs, but the revelation of the coming messiah References to Messiahs, the Mashiach ben Yosef and the Mashiach ben David. And so here is where we're going to begin to see um, this template and archetype of Christ playing out because we see Joseph revealing himself to his brothers. And so I'm excited to get into it as a share probably every single week. This is just a little taste of the Torah portions to encourage you to read through our Old Testament and to see that our Messiah Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One, is the living Torah. And we see the revelation of him all through the scriptures. In this particular Torah portion, I generally don't discuss um, the New Testament readings, but it actually plays into, as they all do, I mean, the the New Testament readings um, follow the themes of the Torah readings. And so the New Testament reading for this particular Torah portion is Luke 24, um, the road to Emmaus, which is one of my favorite um passages from the New Testament and really I would say is the inspiration for this podcast for Sweetness of the Scroll which was our tour inside devotional and so um, we are going to touch on that a little bit and with the Holy Spirit's help we are going to make some connections for you um, in regards to that portion of scripture and this Torah portion, Vayigash. And so we're going to hit some highlights and I pray that you're encouraged in um, our discussion. And so let's look right at Genesis. Um, We're in chapter 44. We're going to start at verse 18. And I feel a little disorganized because I'm looking for a reference and I can't find a reference. So give me a minute. Hallelujah. Okay, here we go. If you could see my work area, you would laugh, okay? Because I have stuff everywhere. Praise Jesus. Okay, so this Torah portion is Genesis 44, verse 18 through 47, 27. And so as we start reading the Torah portion, we see, I'm going to begin reading from the NIV, but I might make references to another translation as well. Um, Genesis 44, 18 says, Then Judah went up to him and said, Pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak a word to my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself. And so here we see 
Judah begins to plead on behalf of his brothers because at the end of the last Torah portion, Judah declares that, listen, the their sin and their iniquity against Joseph, the Lord has revealed. Okay, and so in the plot that Joseph did in hiding a silver cup in Benjamin's bag, you know, he's letting them know that he's going to keep Benjamin as his slave and Judah has to come before him and plead their case. And we really see here Judah um, repenting, really. And I believe that we as the body of Christ have to come to a a deeper revelation of the power of our repentance. When Jesus came and began his ministry in the gospels, it speaks of how he proclaimed the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. And he said, repent. And then when we see the birth of the church in acts and when Peter is speaking to the people, in Jerusalem and speaking about the coming of the spirit and he's, and they want to know what it is that they need to do to partake of this new kingdom. What does Peter tell him? Repent, repent so that the refreshing can come upon you. And so we have to see the power of our repentance. And this is what we see when Judah um, pleads on behalf of his brothers and their iniquity that, Joseph, who they don't know is Joseph, but this person who is um, in the authority of Pharaoh asking that he be able to stay in Benjamin's stead. And I pause there right at that um, phrase, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself, because I believe I mentioned in our last um, discussion, the last tour portion, how on our Thursday studies, we've been digging deep into this law of agency that we discovered back in the Torah portion with Chaye um, Sarah, where we talked about when Abraham sent his servant out, Eleazar, to find Isaac's wife, and that there was an ancient law of agency that is all throughout scripture. And so I'm not going to go into depth here because we're going to cover a couple different things. But in the last tour portion in the podcast notes, there's an article, I believe, that I placed there that is worth reading. And I'm going to place another article even this week as well because it's so important for us to understand as believers and disciples of Christ to understand this law of agency that's all throughout the scriptures. But Joseph is one representation of it. We saw it with Eleazar. We see it here with Joseph. We'll see it in our next um, set of Torah portions when we get into Exodus with Moses. And so we know that Joseph is basically Pharaoh's agent. He has been elevated to this place of status, which is what his prophecy and the dreams that he had early on as a young man of only 17 were proclaiming the prophecy over his life is that he would be elevated to this place. And Judah and his brothers are now there and we're in the very middle, the midst of the, his prophetic words all coming into play. And so This law of agency means that Joseph acts as Pharaoh in the land, okay? And Pharaoh declared himself that there was no one higher besides Joseph except for him. And so he, Joseph has this rule of authority that has been delegated to him and he acts as Pharaoh's agent. And so Judah is there pleading on behalf of his brothers, And so we're going to um, skip down to verse 33 where he makes his final plea because in those other verses between 18 and 33, he's basically retelling all the things that happened and highlighting to Joseph what happened when they went back to Jacob and how they had to plead with Jacob to even allow Benjamin to come so that they would be able to come before Joseph. Joseph was not going to allow them to even come before him unless Benjamin was there. And of course, we see that Joseph is wanting to lay his eyes upon his brother. And so verse 33 says, 
Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that will come on my father. And so the very fact that Judah was willing to become a slave is a law of restitution that is in play here that is really part of Later on, when we see when the law comes and the law is given to um, the Levitical priests in Leviticus, restitution is really important in God's um, economy. All right. And you'll see later, we'll see later, eye for eye, measure for measure. When Judah was willing, you know, to sell Joseph off, now he sees that he has to also be willing to to become a slave all right and that's where you see the fullness of repentance the restitution the law of restitution is in play and then his repentance he is seeing his own fault he 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 is accepting responsibility for his sin and his iniquity and see that is what moves the heart of god when we repent there's not just sorrow sometimes we think repentance is just sorrow no sorrow the repentance is a change of heart and mind that becomes reflective in our actions okay it's not enough just to be sorry about a wrong action or a wrong thought um It's more, it's important for us also to be sorrowful, to repent before the Lord, but in places where we're able to make complete restitution. I don't want to get off on that, but that we'll, we'll discuss that when we get into the later Torah portions in Leviticus. And these are simple laws that when even God gave it, it shows his nature and his character and shows the way in which he desired us as his image bearers okay as the those that are created in his image how we are supposed to interact with one another okay okay and so clearly um there was dysfunction in the family even the patriarchs had dysfunction which just means that there's grace for all of us hallelujah thank god for his son jesus his indescribable gift okay And that the blood of Jesus is able to cover our sins and to um, cleanse us and make us whiter than snow. And that we have this powerful um, ability to become living vessels, earthen vessels, um, living stones where the spirit of God lives in us and causes us to become um, transformed. Formers in the earth realm, agents of transformation, catalysts for transformation. Okay, that's what Joseph actually, I mean, he is sent to a Gentile nation, which I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but he's sent to a Gentile nation in order for God's plan of redemption to come forth. Okay, but what was a key trigger in it? A key trigger in this shift was Judah's repentance. All right. And I believe that that is so key to the revelation of the kingdom in this time and in this season. When we are wanting to reap the harvest of God, we have to be willing to show people, those that are lost and in darkness, the power of their repentance. That is a key to becoming part of God's kingdom. Okay. And so. We're going to move into chapter um, 45. So after um, Joseph hears Judah's cry, his pleading, okay, for, um, for Benjamin and for his family, for his brothers, it says in um, Genesis 45, 1, then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. So here, listen, Joseph is having what we would call a what psychiatry, I think would call it like a catharsis moment. Like he goes into deep travail, like it's a, a deep release of the grief and the trauma that he experienced. This is like a deliverance, people, a deep um, a release of the trauma that he went through with his family. And we know, we know that he had trauma because when he had his children, 
I got to turn back a couple pages. I hope that I'll be able to find it. All right, back in Genesis chapter 41. Verse 51 says, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. And then the second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Okay? So when he had his children, which we know the naming of children was significant. All right? When he had his children, he was still in a place of healing. All right, because he was trying to forget that hot mess of the dysfunction in his family. And God had brought him to this place of elevation. All right, but here we see that he could not control himself because of the release and the deliverance that was coming because of the power of repentance and restitution. All right, and so he cries out to the point where Pharaoh's household, his servants, everyone that he has authority over is hearing him. They are probably seeing another side of Joseph, okay? The Joseph that they they knew, the Egyptian, because I can't think of the name that Pharaoh had given him. But, you know, he had received a whole new name. And let's just make it plain. He was probably living as an Egyptian, okay? They lived different culturally. He probably had different garb on, which is one of the reasons why when he is about to make this revelation to his brothers, his brothers cannot see him, which takes us to the reason why this is called such an archetype for Christ, okay? Because Jesus, when Jesus came into his own, which we know in John, it says that his own received him not, Jesus came into his own, to his own people, but his own did not receive him. All right. And because of that, God gave the power for us, the Gentiles, to come into and be engrafted in. So this is the power of salvation. This is the power of the redemptive plan of God. So all through Genesis, we see that, yes, God had chosen a people. He has separated out Abram and chosen him to create a great nation that was going to be his inheritance. But even though he had cast aside, which we, I don't have time to go into teaching with that, but he had cast aside the other nations that were at the Tower of Babel because they had got involved in a whole bunch of demonic stuff with fallen angels and all kinds of craziness from Genesis 6, okay? But the other nations he had set aside and said he was going to choose um, Abram and his his seed and his, um, you know, his descendants as his inheritance. So he set aside this nation that became Israel with Jacob, but all along, God had a plan. And we see it here because Jacob, when he goes through this catharsis moment and he is travailing and he is releasing and receiving his deliverance, he goes on and he speaks and he says some things. Okay. And so I am going to switch to another Bible, which I feel is in, important, even the fact of me using it is so important to this time. I'm going to use another translation called the One New Man Bible. Because this is the story of Joseph. The One New Man is the Jew and the Gentile being grafted together into one. Which is um, the half Torah portion. The half Torah portion which is Ezekiel 37.15-28. through 28. This is what this is all about here. How God sent Joseph to actually um, be the deliverer for the remnant. That God was showing his plan of redemption all along. And so um, I'm going to read from the One New Man translation. Where we're going to see how Joseph has come to the revelation that. It was God's plan. Okay. So reading from the One New Man Bible. Genesis 45 verse 2 says. 
And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians of the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And his brothers could not answer him, for they were startled at his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. So now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves that you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. There it is. There it is. That is the deliverance right there. So see, when he had his sons, he was still in a place of healing because he was trying to forget. But he couldn't forget what God had spoken. He couldn't forget what God had prophesied that the time would come for the fulfillment of what he had dreamed. And it was now in right before his eyes. And he was getting, he had gained the understanding that God had sent him beforehand. And so he was proclaiming, this is where you see the power of forgiveness. He was saying to them, listen, you can't even be angry at yourself or what you did. Speaking here, Judah was the one pleading the case for them. Don't be angry at your own sin and iniquity because God had a plan. Going back to our Romans 8, how God was working it all together for their good because he was going to preserve their lives. He was going to preserve his remnant. Hallelujah. And so verse 6 says, the famine has been in the land. This is Joseph explaining to what's going on, what he knew from his prophetic dreams. The famine has been in the land for these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you for a heritage in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and a Lord of his entire house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry, go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not stand around. Listen, I have to stop right there because listen, Joseph is revealing the whole prophetic word of his dreams. And then in the one new man Bible, which is the reason why I had to switch translations where it says, do not stand around that is highlighted. That is in bold. And so when I go to the notes at the beginning of this Bible, um, the translator Reverend William J. Morford, I hope I'm pronouncing my brother's name right. He says in the preface of the Bible, do not ignore the Hebrew negative imperative. When you see do not in bold, which is where we're at right now, know that the expression has no direct English translation. So see, listen. This is why we have to be willing to, I mean, some people, they, they, they strictly King James version, and I'm not here to argue any of that. Okay. But to be like the Bereans and to be students of the word, we have to be willing to go to the original Hebrew and Greek because things get lost in translation. And so if you are a Christian believer who is just beginning to taste the Torah and you're new to reading the Torah portions or even exploring the Jewish roots of our faith, I want to encourage you to get maybe another Bible that goes into deeper explanation of the Hebrew roots and will give you the Hebrew translation and give you a little bit more meat in the word because God bless King James version, but some things do get lost in translation people. And I, I particularly read the NIV and there's a lot that gets lost in the NIV. That don't mean I thought away. I know I have other resources. And so that's my encouragement there. But I was so impressed here with this particular note because it says, It is in bold to let you know that the phrase means even more than saying, do not even think about doing whatever is being warned. One very important thing. So it's it's like extra emphasis. So what is Joseph saying? He's like, look, 
Make haste. Don't be sitting here standing around trying to figure out what's going on. This is the fulfillment of the prophetic dreams that I told y'all about. And God sent me here. You think that you were doing something out of vengeance or out of spite or out of the dysfunction in our family, out of jealousy and envy. But what I got the revelation of is that God sent me before you so that he could perform a great deliverance. And see, even Joseph is prophesying here because He's prophesying about the deliverance that will come through Moses' hand, which is the fulfillment of the word that goes all the way back to Abram. Come on, people. It goes all the way back. This is the sweetness of the scroll. This is how we see the fullness of God's redemption plan. And this is why I love to read the Torah because this helps us to understand the purpose of our Messiah, Yeshua, when he came. When the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, do we clearly understand that because of what was lost in Genesis 3.15, what was lost in Genesis in the fall of the first Adam, that the second Adam had to come, the son of man had to come, whose father was Yahweh, whose his blood is his blood that is upon the mercy seat, that is And he is continually making intercession for us. Listen. This is why the story of Joseph is so powerful. And so. He reveals himself. And here's our encouragement. That. Going back. I'm flipping now to. um, The reason why. This is. This is. An archetype of Christ. And how there's a foreshadowing here. Of Jesus. And him becoming, being the son of suffering. So when he came the first time, when he came in the first advent, Jesus of Nazareth, okay? And he could not be re- be received as the Mashiach. He couldn't be received because it was part of the template. It was part of the plan. He had to be rejected so that the Gentile nations could come in. So that God could take that portion, that remnant that he chose with Abraham. And cause the other 70 nations to come back to him. Which we're going to see later when Jacob goes into Egypt. That's a whole template. Of God using his remnant to bring the whole back. And he's going to send his people into Egypt. Into the Gentile nation. So that he can show that he is all powerful. When we get to Moses. I'm, I know I'm all over the place. But this is the this is the power of the word. How we have to make all these connections. We have to make all these connections in the scripture. And so he says listen. Don't just stand around. It's a negative imperative, which means he is talking business. Make haste. Do what you got to do. Okay. And so I want to read on a little bit further. Whoo, because this is so good. This is so good. I'm I'm just checking here in my notes to see where I want to start reading again. So when he, he. There, he's he is speaking to his brothers. Everyone starts weeping. I'm going to start in verse 16 of 45. And the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. And it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this. Load your beasts and go. Get to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me and I shall give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land now you are commanded do this take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come and also do not regret leaving your household stuff now again this is in bold in this one new man bible which means it's a negative imperative again so this is Pharaoh this is, listen, this is the power of our covenant with Yahweh through, through Yeshua, okay? Because doesn't the word declare that the Gentiles will bless? Listen, he had Egypt even blessing them, okay? And so Pharaoh says, don't regret that you got to leave your stuff because for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours, 
Wow. 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 And so I'm going to read a little bit further because there's a couple of things down in here that I feel is, is worth mentioning as well. And so Pharaoh's on board. Everybody's on board. And the children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh and gave them provisions for the way. To all of them he gave each man changes of clothing. But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of clothing. Okay, so this is one of the first instances where, I mean not the first, but in this particular story. Um, this biblical account, we're seeing some change of clothing. And so I just want to give some... Um, spiritual interpretation. So generally, we just came out of the, the month of Kislev. The Hebrew month of Tevet, I believe, started on the 25th. And so we're out of the that um, season of dreams. But when we look at scripture, we have to know that everything has significance. And these numbers have significance. Even going back to when they sold Joseph for the 30 pieces of silver. So now we see that there is 300. 300 is um, a number that's representative of um, a remnant, a faithful remnant. And then the clothing that he gives to them, clothing just like Joseph's coat was a symbol of his authority. Him giving them new clothing, the brothers' new clothing, I believe is like a prophetic act of um, prophesying that they're becoming the the sons of Israel, the tribes, okay? The tribes that are replacing, okay, going to end up replacing, I can't go into all that, but you, you understand that they're receiving a change of clothing, which is shifting their authority, Okay, because we know that they're going to end up being, they are the foundation of, of Israel, of the nation of Israel. Okay, and so we see the new clothing, we see the 300 shekels of silver that was given to Benjamin, the five sets of clothing, which was grace. Okay, 10 donkeys that was loaded with the best thing of Egypt. I believe 10 is a number for completion, a number for, um, Another sign of government, God's government is 12, but it is a sign of government and authority, completion. When we read through the scriptures, we have to be able to um, discipline ourselves, to pay attention to those things that the Holy Spirit is highlighting. Because all of these things mean something. And so, we see that, um, I want to look and see. What it says in verse, let me see, ba, 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 ba. looking at 45. Okay, I can't find it where I want it in this um, new man Bible, so I'm going to just leave that alone. But listen, that all of that means something. We can't just kind of gloss over those things. We have to pay attention to those things. And um, that was significant what Joseph was doing. I'm still looking. That's why I'm, I'm hesitating because I was looking for something. But I'm going to move on because I only have a few more minutes. I can't believe my time goes so fast. Okay. And so I want us to hop over. Because Joseph told them, don't make haste. Pharaoh's on board. He's taking them. They leave. And they leave with loads of stuff. Now, I know generally those that might be in the stream of, you know, charismatic, non-denominational streams. We usually talk about Moses and the Exodus and the Passover when... Um, the nation came out of Egypt, which we know is is... A strong prophetic symbol of our deliverance and is even more important than most of us realize with the second coming of Jesus. The Exodus account is another um, spiritual template, okay, and is very important for when Jesus, is, Jesus returns. However, we usually talk about how when they came out, they came out with the gold and the silver. You know, listen, they coming in. When they come in, the Pharaoh is... They're coming into the land of Goshen. He's setting aside a portion for this remnant. He's blessed. They bless coming in and they bless going out. That's covenant. That's covenant. So 
all the time we want to focus on that deliverance with Moses. But I just want to highlight that you see here that even when they were invited to come and come into Egypt and come to the land of Goshen, that they were blessed, that God's people, God had a remnant. Okay. Even in the famine, because listen, Joseph had just told him it's going to be five more years of famine. This is in the famine. God's people. He had a remnant. Okay. That was blessed from the Gentile nation. All right. And so that, listen, he that have ears to hear, let him hear. All right. And so I got to get to this last portion because I'm running out of time because I feel like it's so important. So listen, they get home. They're telling Jacob that, that Joseph is still alive. And, um, when Jacob hears it, he's excited. All right. I am reading. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. I'm going to read. From verse 26, 45, 26. And told him saying, Joseph is still alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And his heart fainted, for he did not believe them. And they told him all the instructions of Joseph, which he had said to them. And when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, now you see, we didn't want from Jacob to Israel. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is alive, and I shall go and see him before I die. Okay, so I want us to get to... Um, chapter 46 because it's so much here in 46 and Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac so listen places are important he goes to Beersheba and he offers his sacrifices so I'm going to give you the reference because I don't have time to read it now Genesis 26 18 and then verses 23 through 25 we know that Isaac was there in Beersheba and he went and he reopened the wells that the Philistines had closed from Abraham and so Beersheba was a holy place where the altar was that had been set aside Okay, it was like a portal. So when Jacob got there, when Israel, he offered the sacrifices. And when he got to the portal and after he offered the sacrifices, we see that verse 2 of chapter 46 says, And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night. Now we out of the month of Kislev, but we see God is still communing and communicating through the night visions and dreams. He says, and God spoke, the scripture says, and God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. Now listen, this is double name. So that that's serious. All right. Jacob, Jacob, he's getting his attention. And he said, here I am. Here I am is the Hebrew word Hanani. Very important phrase there. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be in awe, which means do not fear to go down to Egypt. For there I shall make a great nation of you. Verse 4 says, I am going down with you into Egypt. And I am shall also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand upon your eyes. Listen, here we have a vision coming to Jacob, to Israel. He, he replying, Hanani, when God is speaking to him, he's saying, listen, don't be afraid to go down into Egypt because this is part of the plan. And you're going to die in Egypt because he says, and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes, which means he's going to be put to rest there in Egypt. And so when he had got that confirmation, verse five says that then Jacob rose up from Beersheba and the sons of Israel carried Jacob and their father, their little ones, and they went on their way. Listen, I'm going to have to end our time together right here. But here we see Jacob went to the altar, offered sacrifices. He worshiped the Lord and the Lord came and confirmed and said, listen, go, go. Yeah, I'm confirming. This is all part of the plan. Now, we don't have time to go into when they got there. We have a list of the genealogies and we get the number of the persons that went with Jacob, which were 70 in all, including Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, which we know are included with the sons 
of Israel with his sons. And so we see that that fullness coming, the 70 coming, which takes us to that understanding of what is said in Ezekiel, how God had all of a long, all along he had this plan. All right. Although he had chosen Abraham and had chosen Israel as his as his inheritance, which it says in Psalms 82, he chose Jacob as his inheritance when he scattered the other nations. He still already had his plan of redemption. All right. He already had his plan and he allowed when Yeshua came the first time, he allowed his own to reject him, which is what Joseph was rejected by his brothers. Yeshua was rejected by his own so that the Gentile nations could be engrafted in. All right. I am trying to move so fast. Romans 11 is where Paul explains this. I'm going to read a little bit because Romans 11, if you start in Romans 11, 25, it talks about how Israel is going to be saved. Um, I'm going to read now and I'm reading from the NIV. I have a few minutes. I'm going to read this fast. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as is it. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn godliness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Okay. And so there is going to come a fullness of time. When Yeshua comes again and he is recognized by his people and all of Israel will be saved. And we know that some have already come into the fold, but because it is template, we have been able to be engrafted in and we will become one new, one new man in Christ Jesus, Jew and Gentile. And that is the power of the redemption story, the power of the gospel. I have to end it here because I'm running out of time. God is so good. I pray that this blessed you and that you were encouraged by it. I'm just going to share our breath prayer right real fast and then we're going to close. So Father, may the light of Christ shine through your people in such a way that those who do not know him are drawn into your kingdom. And may we be a drink of water to the thirsty soul and may, be, may we be the salt of the earth. As our Messiah has declared, if he be lifted up from the earth, he will draw all men to himself. I pray the grace and the shalom of God upon you in this season. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for listening and see you next week for another Taste of Torah. For deeper study, join our online Torah study, Sweetness of the Scroll, by visiting our website at wordofencouragement.org.